Hello. All right, thanks. Uh, hey, uh, my name's Han. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate here. Um, I work mainly at the CISA lab at Boston University. Uh, we mainly do operating systems research there. Um, uh, and this is work done with my colleagues at the CISA lab along with my advisor, Jonathan Apavu and uh, Orvan Krieger. So kind of the focus here is kind of different. Uh, I may kind of talking about hardware stuff and also about towards cloud ap applications. Um, so when we, when we think about cloud applications, there's many a couple features that are coming up that we've noticed is that they're kind of usually single purpose, such as like a key value store or uh, some sort of uh, 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 network server, or, um, and they're also kind of uh, network uh, sensitive. And in, in terms of academia, there's been uh, two kinds of ways that researchers have been tackling trying to optimize the applications running in the cloud. Uh, the first is via kernel bypassing. So you can, so these are usually, you can think about unit kernels or, or user level network stacks where you're bypassing the, the traditional overheads of running it on a monolithic kernel. Uh, the other side is kind of doing like a hardware offloading where you're offloading a lot of the compute in terms on the devices. So programmable storages, programmable NICs, et cetera. And we think given these two general areas, there's a unique opportunity with unit kernels where what if you could adapt your application both at the software layer and the hardware layer? And what would that mean? So, and that's kind of what I'm gonna allude to in a bit. Uh, so we kind of just took a look at one of the, uh, some, a very basic device that you can find in most data centers, which is just a simple uh, 10 giggy NIC from Intel. Uh, we, we went through their uh, data sheet, which is the sheet you kind of have to follow if you want to write your own device driver for the NIC. So we, and we kind of categorized different components of the NIC. So you can see here, the actual NIC consists of actually about around 5,600 different registers. So these are registers that you as a software will write to it to configure it in a certain way for your application or for the OS in general. And each of these registers are two to 32 bits. Um, and then we instrumented counters inside Linux and found that by default, they kind of just initialize about 1,300 of them, so a quarter of them. And we we're kind of curious, why, why these 1,300? And is there, is, there something we could, is there something they're doing with these 1,300 registers that could be interesting to explore? And, and that's what we kind of did, is by looking at this complicated device and trying to understand what makes it complicated and what, and, and what kind of modifications could we do to it? So one of the first simple experiments that I did on the MOC by using their uh, hardware isolation layer um, allows you to basically boot up your own modified kernel or write your own device driver and test it there. Uh, we set up two, two nodes running this X, 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 uh, 520 uh, Intel NIC. And then the only parameter that we tune inside a CentOS 7 Linux kernel is the, the amount of delay that the device a hardware interrupt fires when a packet comes in. So by default, Linux sets it at about one microsecond. We, 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 we changed it for a couple variations at zero microseconds. So every time a packet comes in, if your core is ready to handle that, that, that interrupt, it gets fired and you handle it. Or there's a delay of four microseconds and 64 microseconds, which is kind of a degenerate case uh, considering syscalls take about 50, uh, syscalls and like memory accesses take Slightly, slightly less than that. And, and we ran various uh, benchmarks on this. So these are just, just your normal uh, network benchmark, benchmarks that you would run. So iperf is measuring uh, throughput. So, so for a fixed message size, it tries to send as much as possible as measuring uh, how much you can fill that pipe between the two nodes. Whereas netpipe, netpipe is measuring latency. So for a specific message size, it does a ping pong of it and it tries to measure how fast you can get a response back. And then the third one is a, uh, mem is a mem memcached running this Facebook ETC workload. So this is a workload that they publish uh, when they were benchmarking their memcached servers. This is kind of a more mixed request where you have keys and value sizes of a few bytes to kilobytes. So, so just looking at, so in the top left, I have the, uh, the iperf number. And 
like we see here. So this red bar is the Linux default, which is one microseconds. And this is measuring throughput at a message size of 256 kilobytes. So in this case, uh, the higher the better. So we saw that you know, just, by, just by changing a simple parameter, like uh, increasing the amount of uh, delay from one microsecond to four microsecond, we got about like a 20% increase for that message size. And, and likewise, and if you look at NetPipe 1, which is measuring latency, so lower the better. And this is for a measure size 256 bytes. We saw that, you know, at like we, like I, like I think uh, a network device driver should work. If a packet comes in and you can fire the interrupt and it gets handled and it sends a result back, you should have the lowest latency. And that's what we found here also. Although for the degenerate case, you see with the 64 uh, microsecond delay, it's, it's kind of slower. And so, and also for the four microsecond delay, which is the yellow bar here, uh, there's some effect here that I'm still trying to understand for why it got lower latency. It might have something to do with the way the kernel is doing coalescing of packets when it's coming in. Um, so, so now you might think that maybe, maybe the four microsecond one delay for that specific register on that specific device is kind of a good setting, right? So the next one we ran is the memcached benchmark. So here, so the memcached we're measuring 99 percentile latency at an SLA of 500 microseconds. So that's this pink bar here. And we're measuring throughput. So, so here on, on the x-axis, the higher the throughput, the better uh, once you hit that 500 microsecond SLA. So we found that the actual opposite was true, right? So the actual four microsecond one actually performed pretty bad compared to the one that had the, uh, the default Linux, which is here, the red bar, and also the degenerate case of 64 microsecond differences. So, 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 what the, so what the simple experiment at least tells you is that there's something, there's, there's some interesting questions you can ask about the device at this point, right? So the first is that no single configuration works for all the workloads, obviously. But then, but then you kind of wonder about, so that's only one register. And for that one register, the, the number of bits you can change for measuring the delay is, is about 10 bits. So that means you can vary that number from zero up to 1,000, right? So what does that mean in that case? Is there a weight attached, is, can you attach a weight to this register? in terms of how, how, how important is it uh, for configuring a device for your workload. And also, like I mentioned earlier, there are about 5,000 different registers inside the device itself. So how would you kind of discover this, this entire space in terms of finding out w which of these registers uh, could, could, could potentially make a significant impact uh, on, on the application you're trying to run? And then other questions that might be interesting is, how could you expose this up to the application, where you could have the application that already has significant control over the network side, for example. Could you give it more control over the actual hardware itself? Um, and then, obviously, with other devices, could you extend this to different kinds of accelerators, different kinds of storage devices, et cetera? And, and that's kind of the direction I'm interested in exploring. Uh, so, so the first thing is we could, given, given the tooling that's been developed for the past decade in terms of learning, could we actually propose this as a learning problem where giving a specific uh, network benchmark and a bunch of statistics, such as on the device itself, it actually in real time collects about 80 different statistics registers that it fills in with different counters for different behaviors. Those are actual data that you can use, but it's just sitting there. Uh, the only reason you would look at it is to make sure that that particular queue got a got a message. If it's zero, then something broke with your device driver. Otherwise, you just kind of leave it, right? And also, in, even inside Linux, they provide something called an ETH tool, which is a user-level application that you can modify the device itself. Uh, but even then, uh, there are certain features in the device where they're still, not, they're still not kind of exposed via that interface. And that's something that you have to do manually. And there is really no uh, kind of general consensus for how would you even go about configuring the device at that point. The other interesting thing you could look at is some of these device features are also actually dynamic. So that means while your device is running and doing packet processing, you can change its behavior uh, in real time. So stuff like doing cache injection where you can trigger the device to uh, inject your packet into your L2 cache directly. You can do that dynamically or you can even modify your interrupt rate direct, dynamic, dy dynamically. So that opens up a lot of questions for what it could mean for your application if you could modify your device in real time, right? And obviously, the, the holy grail here is what if you could take the unikernel model, 
and do some sort of co-optimization of both your software stack and the actual hardware for your application, which is kind of a golden dream that hopefully with the uh, device, with the bare metal isolation could be achieved. Um, yeah, so that's all for me. Uh, thank you. <laughs>